Good afternoon. I thank everybody for coming. Uh, we've got a lot of material to cover, so I'm going to try to get to uh, everything as quickly as possible here. Um, some of you were here last night, some of you were not. Um, who is coming out ministries? Um, <clears throat> this ministry is about four uh, individuals redeemed from homosexuality. The um, church didn't come and get us, God did. And then uh, he put us together by divine appointment. He reached us through divine intervention. Uh, we didn't know each other existed. We're from all over the United States. And so um, this is certainly not a contrived ministry, but it was an amazing um, feat that God put together for us to help reveal to others that victory is possible through Jesus Christ. Some people wonder, wow, uh, that's a little uh, misleading, isn't it? That title, Coming Out Ministries. And so I tell people about uh, when we're at conferences like GYC or ASI and, and people walk by and they see our booth and they see that logo and they kind of like move by. Ah, wait, 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 wait come, come here. What, what do you think that means? Well, you know, it, uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I, I said, do you think it, it has something to do with homosexuality? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, we wanted to give the true meaning to the phrase coming out. And that comes from 1 Peter 2.9 that says he brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so we've stuck with the, with the uh, name coming out. Um, it draws a lot of people to, to engage in conversation with us. Um, we are not forceful. Um, Jesus is not forceful. He's invitational. And so we want to be invitational to someone who... Um, is wondering, who's questioning, what their feelings are telling them. And the enemy would have us believe that feelings equal truth. And feelings are something that we haven't talked about in the history of this denomination. We shove those feelings underneath the church pew and they just think that they'll take care of themselves. Um, and so Satan has uh, laid uh, claim to those secret sins, um, but they're really not secret. Uh, they may be secret to those in the congregation, um, or between ourselves, but God certainly knows our secrets. I want to um, ask you to bow your heads with me as we have um, prayer and invite the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you know again the delicacy of this topic um, and how controversial it is today. It never seemed to be that way. It was always <clears throat> known that homosexual behavior uh, was sinful, but now that people have exposed themselves and their feelings, many are having sympathy towards um, those feelings instead of towards that individual and what's possible as a result of the power of Jesus Christ. So I ask today particularly that you will send your Holy Spirit here, that you will pour your blood out over um, this auditorium, that you will provide us with safety over the equipment, um, over myself and over those listening, um, that you'll send the Holy Spirit to convict people's hearts, and that because of the blood that you shed for us, that you will send Satan and his angels far away from here. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Got a question for you. Can you pray the gay away? Nope. Hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, I, <clears throat> it's interesting. You know, that's the one thing God can't do, right? He can't help the gay person. He can take care of all the other problems, but he can't do anything about the person who's gay. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> Usually the prayer goes something like this. I prayed it as a child. Please, God, make me straight. And almost every gay person has prayed that prayer. And so God answers every prayer, but he doesn't give us something that isn't necessarily what his plan is for us. <clears throat> so is the emphasis on the kind of sex that I'm having, or is the emphasis on the fact that he wants my heart? James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your faults to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That's something that we haven't done a very good job of 
<clears throat> as a denomination. We don't even share our faults with each other because we're afraid of another sin that we've whitewashed. That would be gossip. <clears throat> There's often prayer meetings where <clears throat> people will say, please pray for me. Um, I think my husband is cheating on me. Please pray for uh, my husband. I think he's involved with pornography. Uh, please pray for me. I have an overeating problem. Please pray for my grandmother. She's dying of cancer. And how many people do you see raise their hands and say, please pray for me. I'm suffering from same-sex attraction. Now, why wouldn't you get a request like that? Judgment. And so today, judgment is being used as a big excuse. Don't judge me. And so then we kind of negate everything, and we just let people be. <clears throat> but I want to share with you that we are, it's not my position to ever judge anyone else, but it is God's position to act as judge, and his word is judgment. And so it is important that we can direct people in being, being led and directed by the Holy Spirit to God's word that we can trust for all time. Don't be caught in that cycle that's going on. Don't judge me. But let's make sure that we're loving somebody. It's not my job to either condemn or to condone, but to love that individual without compromising the truth of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> For me, I will tell you that the only way the gay goes away is in a constant, surrendered, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ, which involves much, much prayer. And so that's the only way I have a safeguard against what comes natural to me. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we're still sinners, he died for us. We are not hopeless in his sight. Your son, your daughter, your friend, they are not hopeless just because they're gay. And they don't need your stamp of approval. They need your love and they need your prayers. And they need you to walk with them through this journey. You don't pray for somebody tonight and <clears throat> ask for the change to take place and then tomorrow they're, some, they're just like you. <laughs> you know, they become heterosexual as though that that's the antidote for sin. I would guess that there are married couples sitting in this audience right now that would tell me that marriage isn't the antidote for sin. So it's not about making sure that I have a girlfriend or that I get a wife so that I am now in the same playing field as everyone else. It's about praying that I will have an engagement with Jesus Christ, that I will fall in love with him, that I will trust him, that I will take every care and concern to him, and that I can, I can rely upon him to see me through whatever temptation comes my way. That goes for somebody who's same-sex attracted as well as somebody who's heterosexual who desperately wants to get married. But it may not be God's plan. Claiming the victory has to start at the very first sight of temptation. Is it starting to sound like we're all in this together? Today, I want to help you recognize that we're all level at the foot of the cross. And we've been called to love and to support one another. I was asked after a um, television interview with someone a few years ago, how did gays gain so much power? Anyone care to guess? I answered this gentleman and I said, you know, I think that I can give you the answer, but I'm not sure that you're going to like it. What happens to children who are in <clears throat> primary and junior class and they're reciting scripture and <clears throat> they become youth and they are in front of the church and they're um, <clears throat> singing uh, special music. I'm sorry, I can't get rid of this frog. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> as they become young teenagers, and they wake up and they begin to have attractions. They don't dare expose to anyone that they have same-sex attraction. 
and the church <clears throat> hasn't done a very good job at reaching out and helping people. They've whispered and pointed, and I hate to say it, but our congregations have often been largely responsible for pushing people into the very community that they didn't want them to move into. I was one of those people. It happened to me. It happened to my colleagues. If we fail to pour out God's love to every sinner, what happens? <laughs> the momentum of sin will increase. God has invited us to be caretakers for those who are hurting and who need healing that Jesus promises us. Your theme, my theme today, is to be bold in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is powerful. Do we trust, do we believe, do we firmly grasp the gospel the way Jesus Christ asks us today? Are we cultural Christians or do we have a faith belief and that we are putting Jesus to the test and that we're following his example and doing what he requests from us? It's not easy. And I know there are people in this room that can tell me that. You have a testimony you might not be standing up here and sharing it with me, but you have a testimony. You have something in your life, I hope, that you never thought that you could get over or give up, that God has given you the ability to do. That is your testimony to someone else who is suffering from something different. We don't all have the same temptations, but we all have the same power available to us through Jesus Christ. I am reminded of Mary Magdalene. Please don't forget who Jesus ministered to. He didn't stand in places like this where people who already believed came in and listened to him all the time. He was in the presence of those who thought there was no hope. I think that the ministry to, to Mary went something like this. I think that Jesus saw Mary one day and said, Hello, Mary. What a beautiful lady you are. You know, I'm going to be doing some talking today. We're going to have a meal together. We're going to share together. I would love for you to come and listen. Will you come spend the day? And so she's like, wow, you know, here's somebody who's like not judging me, who, somebody who's interested in me. And so Mary goes with him, and at the end of the day, Jesus says, Mary, please don't go back to those men. What are you talking about? I like these men. They're fine. They care about me. They love me. Okay. And so Mary goes away, and then the next day, Jesus sees Mary, and today she appears more radiant than ever, and he says, Mary, you are even more beautiful today than you were yesterday. And today I'm going to do some more talking, and we're going to share another meal together. Come hang out with me. And so Mary does, and she listens intently, and she's just so blessed by what she hears. And so at the end of the day, Jesus says to her again, Mary, please, please, don't go back to those men. Jesus, it's okay. These are my family. These men care about me. I'm fine. And so he lets her go again. Until one day, Jesus sees Mary and she comes into his presence again. And she said, Jesus, I want to follow you. Because I see that you love me. And I finally understand the difference between love and what I thought was love but was really abuse. Because you have demonstrated your love to me. And I think that that is the role that Jesus has given us. To walk with somebody through the journey. Not endorse their sin but to let them know that there is hope and that we'll never give up on them. Jesus has given us a priceless gift, a priceless talent. But what are we doing with it? Because I pray that when judgment day comes that he doesn't say to any one of us, you wicked, lazy servant, you did nothing with the gift that I gave you. I don't know you. And so as Pathfinder leaders, I, can't, I couldn't do this. 
uh, you are in the most precarious situation because you have, you have so many things at stake. You've got parents who have trusted their children to you. You have parents who may not even be really plugged in with Jesus Christ, and now you have their children, and now you're the role model. You're the demonstrator of God's love. And so you have a big burden, a big weight on you. You have a commission from Jesus Christ to you to represent Jesus and the changing power that he offers us. And it's not by being a checklist Christian. It's by demonstrating that love and only his pure love will change somebody's life. It's changed mine. So if the opposite of homosexuality isn't heterosexuality, what is it? Someone's got to know. I'm glad I'm still running around in this ministry because it's so important that you recognize it's holiness. The opposite of any sin or sinful behavior is holiness. And it's freely offered to us. And it's by engaging with Jesus Christ and there are texts in the, in the Word of God that says to be holy as He is holy. There's no effort in me that can make that happen. But by continual surrender to Jesus Christ and making room for His truth and His love and His power in my life, His holiness begins to take up more space in my heart. And it can happen to you. For as long as I can remember, we don't talk about homosexuality. And because of that, I ended up running out into the gay community for 40 years, seeking for love in all the wrong places. We ignore this, or we just whisper about it. In fact, we do this with all sexual sin. And so here's what happens when we do that. By not talking about them, by ignoring them, these sins fester. It leaves the sinner hopeless and helpless. It distances them from God. And let's pray that it doesn't do this, but I've seen it happen to many. They end up leaving God's family because they're not finding the hope and the healing that is promised through Jesus Christ. We can't afford this because these are precious lives to Jesus Christ and they should be precious lives to you and me. While time and culture changes, and that's what you're hearing today from many people, you're hearing it from young people today, and maybe even some of you today are thinking, we are in a different time. The Word of God is not relevant today. It's antiquated. It was for then. It's an old history book. If that's the case, then God is not fair. Because He says that His Word is for all time. He says that I am the same yesterday today and tomorrow. Have you begun to question as to whether or not homosexuality is really sin? I'm not going to go over every text, but I'm going to summarize with this. Every single place homosexuality is mentioned in the Word of God, it is in a negative connotation. Every place. Nowhere, not one single text, is there to tell you that intimacy between two same-gendered people would be honorable in the sight of Jesus Christ. Only marriage between a man and a woman is ordained and sanctified. That is carried from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. There's not a single verse to provide for a same-sex union. And lastly, physiology clarifies God's purpose, and I'm not even going to go there. When I gave, really, I'll tell you, that argument, even with an atheist, is like, well, and the gay community doesn't want to talk about that today. Um, Somebody told me once when I brought that fact up, they said, "Um, you need to read the book, um, How to Win and Influence, How to Win People, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I thought, oh, that just solidifies the point that I was making. Um, after I 
gave my life back over to Jesus Christ, I began to study out his word and was reading through the New Testament. I'd forgotten all about this verse. 1 Corinthians 6, <clears throat> 9 through 11. Usually you only hear 9 and 10. And as I was reading it, I found it uh, very revealing. There's strong clarification here. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you are. Oh, is that what? Oh, yes, that's right. Praise God. Rejoice that it says, that is what some of you were. Do you know that, what that said to me? I had been so ridiculed, so ostracized, so alienated, so rejected from birth. My mother didn't even want me prenatally. And the church was real good at pointing out that I was a, an, a blight on the face of, of humanity. I didn't matter. If you don't get anything out of these presentations, I want you to know one thing that I make an impress to every audience that I speak to. You matter. You belong. And you are loved. It may not feel that way and with regards to the people that are around you. That doesn't matter. What matters is this way. Never give up hope. Never give up the truth. Never compromise the truth. Always know that Jesus loves you. And when you put your faith and your trust in him, he will make sure that you know his love. <clears throat> Some of you heard me say this last night. <laughs> Getting a little personal here. We can't share what we don't have. And so if you have young people that you're associating with, if you have a husband, a child, who's in great need of a revelation of Jesus Christ in their life, and you don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus, what are you going to give? What do you got? Isn't your pitcher empty? So... Let's look at the routine here a little bit that we might be caught up in. And we might have uh, prayer in the morning and the evening. Is that good? Aren't we good connected that way? Is that enough? Studying the Sabbath school lesson every night, that ought to be pretty good, right? Aren't we sinking in there pretty good with Jesus now? How about our daily devotions? And you're thinking, wow, Wayne, you know, come on. <laughs> what does it take? God has not invited you to come and visit him once a week. <laughs> He's asked you to pick up your cross and to follow him. When I talk about intimacy to audiences today, a lot of people look back at me with blank faces. And it tells me that God is still holding back the four winds because he wants us to know him intimately. He wants us to come together as a church family, not just as a, a club that meets every, every week. You know, oh, I hope the pastor doesn't speak too long because I'm really getting hungry and I saw some really good food come in. You know, and I saw a lot of people that I want to talk to on. I want to see what they're doing after sunset. I want to go, you know, miniature golfing with them or I want to go to a movie with them or, you know, whatever. They, the focus is nowhere near being on Jesus Christ. So I'm knocking on the door of your heart and that's what Jesus is saying that he's doing. Behold, I stand at the door and knock and if anyone answers, I will come in. And I guarantee you, that if you take time today and you invite Jesus into your heart to take over every aspect, every minute, every hour of your life, your life is going to change. I guarantee it. 
My only safety today is in my communication with Jesus Christ. But I, I will tell you today, my, my body, my carnal nature, cries out for the very things that was destroying it before I gave my life to Jesus Christ. The enemy is still at work. Talk to him. I, you know, I, when I was converted... I began to say, I'm, I'm not safe without you. So I took him to work with me, and I would talk to him while I was doing my work. I would get up and go take a break, or at lunchtime, I would communicate and, and talk to God, you know, while all kinds of temptations would be running my, by me on a, a hot summer day, and people were jogging around the lake, and the enemy was always trying to distract me. Keep your focus on Jesus Christ. He will not let you down. Okay, so people come and they, they listen to me and they, they want to know, you know, well, so uh, are you cured? You know, what's the secret? You know, am I still tempted? Um, or you may be sitting there thinking, how can I get my son or my daughter to become straight? Sin afflictions and problems are different for everyone. How do you make somebody stop loving chocolate cake? How do you make somebody stop feeling like they have to see every single sports game that comes on? Because when I head into the office on Monday morning, I've got all my buddies and they're going to ask me about those Giants and about those Dodgers and, you know, the Braves. And i got to know this stuff or I'm a nobody. Or how do you stop watching every cooking show that comes on? Or anything that is stealing the time away that you could be spending with Jesus Christ. I know you've heard messages like this before. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that it makes a difference. Because when I took the focus off of myself and I put it on Jesus Christ, my life changed. Amen. It's not about what my desires are, it's about what his desires are. You'll never know what God's will is for you unless you start spending the quality time with him to find out. So what's the cure? Many come to hear me speak and they want to know, they're waiting for the magic button. What the step process is, is, is you know, are, so are you straight now? By changing my sexual orientation, is that what makes me more acceptable to Jesus Christ? Let me ask you this. If I was baptized and I went under the water gay and I came up straight and I started chasing all the women in the church, would you be happy? <laughs> is that the change we're looking for? You know, interestingly, it is what some people are looking for. And I got put on this Richter scale about... You know, oh, are you more attracted today? Well, maybe tomorrow. You know, we got to get you married off here. <laughs> well, I can tell you that my colleague, Mark Ron Woolsey, is married and has five children and five grandchildren. I can tell you that my colleague, Mike Carducci, has uh, developed intimate desires in, in finding somebody who God might send him to marry. I have not been given those intimate, erotic desires, but I don't put it past God because God is in the business of miracles. And let me tell you something. I experience more intimacy sexually in the world than any of you will ever have. And so I think that when God brought me back, he said, Wayne, you don't need to have intimacy with somebody else. You need to have intimacy with me. And if the time is right, I may put that one woman in your pathway for you to have those desires for, to fall in love with, because I'm not asking you to fall in love with the entire female population. <laughs> but if he doesn't do that, and if it really does mean that as a converted gay person that I'm living alone with Jesus Christ, is that too much of a price to pay for eternity with Jesus? Think about this today. Yes, you can have whoever you want. You can do whatever you want on this earth if you desire. And God respects that decision. But it will only be for here. So it's up to you to decide. It's up to you to help bring this clarity 
into some young person's life. To put into their minds that they can trust Jesus through everything. And he will see them through. So, what's the magic button? It's Jesus. A constant, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. And so what does abide mean anyway? I had to look it up. <laughs> Whoa. To endure without yielding. Um, I'm pretty weak. To bear patiently. I'm not patient at all. To accept without objection. I always object. <laughs> to remain in a fixed or stable state. Me? Oh, anyone in my childhood would tell you that I was not stable or fixed at all. It sounds impossible, doesn't it? But I will tell you today that with my life with Jesus Christ, that my parents would be the first ones to tell you that they have seen a change take place that they never dreamed could have taken place. My colleagues will tell you that I'm a different person than when we started this ministry four years ago. I pray that you and I both are different people as we advance in our relationship with Jesus Christ and experience the healing that he has promised. I want you to be able to teach pathfinders that they can abide in Jesus Christ and that they've got great rewards in their future as they walk with God. So who am I today? <clears throat> am I a gay Christian? Am I a gay Adventist? Paul was on his way to Damascus and he had an intervention from God. And God said, Paul, you know something? You've been in the business here of supporting the killing of Christians. I, I, I want to make a proposition to you. I, I'd like you to actually become a Christian. Oh, well, Paul... Like, wow, you know, this is, this is definitely an intervention taking place here. And, and so, yes, God, I will become a Christian. And so from that day forward, after he became a Christian, did he identify as a Christian-killing Christian? Oh, so he wasn't the man he used to be? Okay. Hmm. How about somebody who has been cheating on their wife, Finally, they come to God and they ask God's forgiveness. They ask their wife's forgiveness. They ask the church's forgiveness. As they walk forward, do they identify as an adulterating Christian? Let me try one more for you. Bill Wilson did a great thing for the world in bringing about an organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. He rather than the church, went about helping people recognize that they could get victory over sin. But he didn't use Jesus Christ as the model. And he put an albatross around their neck. And so every time I would go into an AA meeting, I'd say, hello, I'm Wayne, I'm an alcoholic. I haven't drank for 40 years, but I'm an alcoholic. This is a little tough for some people. But when you come through the doors of the church to the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ, are you an alcoholic? No. Because Jesus Christ shed his blood for you and his blood bought, bought your victory. His blood cleanses you 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that he forgets the past. He washes me clean, and I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. I am not an alcoholic. I am not a gay person today. I am a new creature in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ paid for that. It's yours to claim. If you're claiming today that you're an alcoholic, please, please surrender that over to Jesus Christ and accept the new identity that he has given to you. Do not define yourself by your temptations. 
define yourself by the identity that you have in Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 12 and 13 says, Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. By abiding in Jesus Christ, Philippians 4.13 tells us that all things are possible that would please and honor and glorify Jesus. This morning you were each given a first aid kit. Did you all get it? No? Nobody got it? I have one. I carry it with me all the time. My friend and colleague, uh, Mike Carducci, gave it to me. It's a little different than the ones that you have, but only in the sense that it's in a different cover. And it's called Steps to Christ. That, my friend, is your first aid kit. One of the most beautiful books ever, ever written. If I have a stumble or a fall of some nature, I just open it up and I start reading about the sinner's need of Christ. And I start reading about repentance. And they start reading about confession and faith and acceptance and the test of discipleship, which is my favorite chapter. And it confirms what I've just been sharing with you. On page 58, it says, those who become new creatures. Become what? New creatures in Jesus Christ will bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Whoops, must be a misprint. Long-suffering. That's a gift. <laughs> it is. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, as found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Many Christians think that if you're walking with God, it's a smooth pathway. But let me remind you that the streets of gold are in heaven and not on earth. She goes on to say, they will no longer fashion themselves according to their former lusts. But by the faith of the Son of God, they will follow in his steps, reflect his character, and purify themselves even as he is pure, the things they once hated, they now love, and the things they once loved, they hate. There is no evidence of genuine repentance unless it works reformation. The loveliness of the character of Christ will be seen in his followers. If we abide in Christ... If the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, our thoughts, our purposes, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God as expressed in the precepts of his holy law. This is the abiding that brings change. It's a promise to you. Take advantage of it. When, when we enter this special relationship with someone, we want to spend more time with them. And so... It's much that way with Jesus. He wants us to court him. As that relationship grows, we don't want to be separated from that person. Do you see where I'm going? We need to be constantly connected to Jesus Christ. A number of times after I've spoken... <clears throat> Someone will come to me and they'll say, ah, so Wayne, I, um, can you, can, I, are you still tempted? Really? It used to really annoy me until God gave me this. Are you? Oh, well, uh, uh, oh, your sin's different than mine, that's right. Mine's the worst one. Well, why would it be fair for Jesus to take my temptations away and not yours? You better know I'm tempted. 
you better know that the enemy is angry with me for having left his camp because he had me believing and he has the majority of this world believing that you can live by your feelings. God's got it mixed up. You can explain that to him on judgment day. I'm sure he'll listen. No, he was the one that thought there was a better way. He's the one that's telling you that there's a better way, but he's the one that is no longer in heaven. Don't listen to him. It's not the fact that I'm still tempted. What matters is what I'm doing with my temptations. At the first sign of temptation, I need to call out for Jesus Christ. James 4, 7 says to submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Do what? Oh boy, you all failed. We always miss that first action word. I don't have the power to resist Satan. But if I surrender and submit my will to Jesus Christ, he will empower me. He will pri provide the strength. He will provide the power. Remember to submit yourself, submit your will to Jesus Christ and say, I want your will to take over in my life, not mine. The only safety that I have with Jesus Christ today is to remain in an unbroken relationship with him. And that's what he's asking from every single one of us. If you can teach a young person to remain in that relationship with Jesus Christ, that will be the greatest safety mechanism that you can provide them. Plug them into Jesus. It is because of the way that I was raised by my parents that I believe the promise comes full circle that says if you raise a child in the way that they should go, they'll return unto you. Yeah, Jesus lets us go down some dark roads that we don't need to go down, but he knows our heart. He knows who will respond and who will not. And he doesn't give up. And he protects people in some of the most obscene places that you can imagine. No, your angel doesn't run away from you. I think your angel runs to you, protects you, holds on to you. Those prayers that are being offered are covering you. And in the day of your weakness, where you're ready to listen to the love and truth message of Jesus Christ, you'll surrender and give your life fully and completely over to him. <clears throat> we need to love the way Jesus loves. People that are giving their lives back over to Jesus Christ shouldn't be viewed as somebody who's just being been let out of the state penitentiary and that now you're their probation officer. Because if we give that impression, then it inhibits growth and healing. And that distances someone rather than making them feel that they're becoming more of a part of God's family. John 8 tells us that the promises of God's truth sets us free. And so we should be celebrating over this person as the returning prodigal to Jesus Christ, celebrating in the way that, he that heaven celebrates when they return. <clears throat> Many of you are curious about the tools um, and ways that we can reach out to gays or somebody who's struggling with same-sex attraction. Keep them involved in Pathfinders, in uh, small community groups, in your churches. Um, keep them busy. Keep them um, in... Um, in touch with Jesus and the love of Jesus, um, and that creates a safe environment for them. Be a good listener. Listen to what's on their heart, the frustrations that they deal with, and with your own personal testimony and your own research and study of God's word, you can reveal to them and provide them promises that God will hold true to for that person just the way he's done for you. Prayer. Do not e underestimate the power of prayer. It is powerful. You can't just tell God what to do, but remember you can lay your requests out there for him. <clears throat> he hears them, and I'm living proof of that. And I know that my parents must have wondered in that 40-year journey if God was really hearing their prayers because they didn't see a return to Jesus until 
six years ago, but it did happen. <laughs> Look beyond the sin. Be kind. Get to know the person. Invite them to dinner. You're not going to catch it. I know I'm going to run out of time, but I'm going to tell you this. I have a project for you. How high is that wall between you and the same-sex couple that lives next door or the hedge? The driveway, you come in and you quickly get into the house, take your groceries in. You might have to spill. There they are right now. They're mowing the lawn. I can't say hello. Those disgusting, evil people. I'd like you to do something. I think I just lost connection. Go over to their door. And knock on it. And invite them to dinner. Oh, no, Wayne. Oh, no, no, no. Anything but that. Yeah, no. Invite them to dinner. Fix your favorite food. Have a, a wonderful uh, flower arrangement in the, in the middle of the dining table. And when they come over, do me a favor. Don't put the Bible on the end of the dinner table as though you're going to clobber them over the head with every text that has to do with homosexuality and the word that there is. They're probably not going to stay long, no matter how good your food is. Stop thinking about what goes on behind their bedroom door and think about them as an individual, a, a child of God who he loves just as much as he loves you and your filthy sin. Amen. Amen. And two weeks later, I want you to do something else. Yep. Invite them to dinner again. Oh, Wayne, come on, get over it. Really? Really? I already did that one. I listened to the Holy Spirit. Well, listen to the Holy Spirit again. Invite them back. Find out, what do you like to do for a hobby? Uh, what do you do for a living? Um, you guys want to go on a hike together? Yeah. Get to know them. I guarantee you that probably one, if not both of them, will end up saying something to you like this. Aren't you guys Christians? Now, why would they ask a question like that? Unless it could be that they've never seen a Christian demonstrate the behavior that God has commissioned us to. Eventually, don't be surprised if one, if not both of them, might say to you, you see that we're a same-sex couple and we know that you're Christians. What do you believe? <gasps> oh, no! Not a belief. We don't have to share our belief, do we? That's secret. And don't use the Bible like a sledgehammer either. Well, we believe in the biblical principle that God has set up in the Bible, but that doesn't mean that we don't love and care about people who don't believe the same way. We respect your right to choose to live however you desire. But if you're interested in more about this topic, we'd love to sit down and maybe do some studies with you. Uh-oh. Study? Mm-hmm. You know, especially like when you have somebody you're wanting them to, to see that the Sabbath is the true day of worship, and, you, and there's a study that helps show that. It's just all right in God's Word. You're familiar with that, right? And so you can go through the Bible and show how everywhere in God's ordination of a unity, it's between a man and a woman, and this is what brings him honor and glory, <clears throat> that he even warns us about same-sex attraction, but it's not because he doesn't love us, it's because he does love us, and because he puts guardrails in place, and he doesn't want us to fall off the edges and experience things that we need not experience. It's tough territory. The Holy Spirit will lead you through it. And you should have a church congregation that you can invite this couple into who will be welcomed there. Remember, there's a difference between church attendance, membership, and leadership. This should be a safe place for sinners. It doesn't mean that you endorse or support the sin. Don't exhibit behavior that makes people think that. But don't clobber them over the head so that they don't feel welcome either. What about my kids? I don't want them to become gay. Okay, 
Train your children to know that God's principles are true and loving and for all mankind, but not everyone chooses to follow these because of their own understanding, because of their own relationship, their own dealings in life. They haven't come to the same conclusion that we have. Don't go throw up in their face about, you're going to die in hell. But say, hey, it's good to see you guys. I'm glad you're coming to our church. Hope you can come to our house for dinner sometime. I'd like to get to know you. That's not saying that you adopt their behavior. It's telling people that are living differently that there's that drawing power that Jesus Christ has that makes us want to know him more. How come they care so much about me? In fact, there's the spirit of truth in every single one of us, so they already probably know in their hearts that they're not living the biblical way, but they don't know any other way to live because they've lived by their flesh instead of by the word. We're not incapacitated. Jesus has not abandoned us. He hasn't abandoned anybody. Don't judge them. Direct them to Jesus. Share your relationship with Jesus and let, them, let the Holy Spirit do the convincing. You are not Holy Spirit Junior. Don't expect, like monitoring their attractions to the opposite sex, remember that the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, but what? That's right. Don't try and marry everyone off as though it's the cure. It's their relationship with Jesus Christ that's most important. Celibacy and living in sexual purity can be very lonely. I know. Make sure you are loving this soul into God's family and keep them busy. God's redemptive plan is beautiful, isn't it? Wrap it in love and share it with somebody. And as I've been talking, maybe there's somebody in this room who's been struggling with something that you've thought you can't let go of and suddenly because of this testimony and because of this teaching, you're finding that Jesus has just been waiting for you to surrender that to him. And so I ask if you'll just bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that you have given me to share these teachings, the principles that you've given us that are true and holy for all time. Lord, you have not abandoned us. You love every single one of us equally in this room. There isn't a single person that cannot escape um, cultivated or hereditary sin, Lord. Your offer is the same for every single one of us, that if we would surrender to you with all our hearts, that you'll help dig us out of this muck and mire, that you'll help us fall in love with you more. And by falling in love with you, that is the only time that we would really truly want to obey you and to do your will instead of our own. So I ask, Lord, that you would help me fall in love with you more each and every day. And I pray for that individual or individuals in this room right now who are saying, Lord, take this from me. I give it to you. I am not going to live by my feelings anymore. I'm going to live by the love and truth message, which is not separated from each other that goes together because I want to become that peculiar person for you. I want to stand and live for you in that unbroken relationship with Jesus Christ. Grasp the healing, grasp the victory that is promised to you is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.